Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to my talk. Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. I want to start by thanking Alina, Mike, and Philip for giving me the opportunity at speaking at this uh, prestigious seminar. This talk, I have already given parts of it in other places. For example, uh, to the BAMF meeting in September that Alina was one of the co-organizers and uh, at a conference in Debrecen last summer and at a couple of places in South Africa. But hopefully for some of you, some of these things will be new. So let's move on. So my talk is about recent progress on the Skolem problem. My main co-authors are depicted here, Joel Waknin. He is a director of the Max Planck Institute for Software Systems in Saarbrücken. And uh, the colleague depicted on the right, James Worrell, he is uh, a professor at computer science at Oxford. And uh, here is them, they visited me in South Africa in January of last year. Here is them, a picture with OR Tambo in the airport. Okay, so let's go and let's say what is the Skolem problem? So the basic question is, what is the simplest class of programs for which uh, deciding termination or halting is not obvious? And uh, the answer is simple linear loops. So here is what you do when you're a student and you maybe take the first time a course in computers, in computer science, and you learn some loops. You start with three initial values for x, y, z, and while x is not equal to zero, you have to reassign these values of the variables. So x, y, z goes into 2x plus y, y goes into y plus 3 minus z, z goes into minus 4z plus 6. So the general problem is while x starts with some vector a, and while the first component of the vector x is not equal to zero, x move x to m times x where m is sub matrix well this example is not exactly like that there is also some shift but let's take this as the simplest example so the first one is called the squalene problem because it's you need to decide when is x sub one different than zero because if x sub one is equal to zero then you stop and the second problem is called the positivity problem because while the first coordinate is at least zero, then you can continue. And if the first coordinate ends up being negative, then you have to stop. And what exactly are the Skolem and positivity problems? Here are the Skolem and positivity problem. So the Skolem problem says start with the square matrix K by KM. And the question is, is there a positive integer n such that the top right entry of m to the power n is equal to zero? And the top right entry is just something we chose. We could ask for any particular ij entry. And the positivity question is the same question, instead that you are not asking if it is exactly zero, but you're asking if uh, for every n, m to the power n is greater or equal to zero. And this boil, this can be recast in terms of linear recurrent sequences. A linear recurrent sequence is a sequence. For us, the members are always going to be in Z or in Q. So they're going to be integers or rational numbers, such that they are constants, A1, A2, AK, with the property that UN plus K is a linear combination of the previous K terms with the coefficients A1, A2, respectively, AK. The famous example is the Fibonacci numbers, which starts with 0, 1, and then every term is the sum of the previous two terms. The length of the minimal recurrence, it's called the order of the sequence. And the Skolem problem now can be reformulated in terms of zeros of the linear recurrent sequences. You are given a linear recurrent sequence. The question is, does there exist an n greater or equal to 0, such that u sub n is equal to 0? And the positivity problem is, is it the case that for every n greater or equal to zero, u sub n is greater or equal to zero? And believe it or not, these things are still open in general. Here are some quotes from some famous colleagues. Terry Tao says that is it fatally outrageous that this problem is still open? And uh, Richard Lipton, it calls it a mathematical embarrassment. The most prominent problem whose decidability status is currently unknown. Now, a fact, every linear recurrent sequence can be finitely decomposed into finitely many what they are called non-degenerate linear recurrent sequence. So let me give you some example. 
you take the sequence u sub n such that u sub n is zero for all n odd and u sub n is two for all n even. Then if you think about it, this sequence is constant every two other terms. So then you can say that the minimal recurrence is un plus two is equal to un. And that's a linearly recurrent sequence of order two. Now, what does it mean non-degenerate? To each linearly recurrent sequence, you can associate something which is called the characteristic polynomial, which is going to appear later on slides. But what it basically is, you take this relation from here and you write down the polynomial x to the power k minus a1 x to the power k minus 1 and so on down minus to a sub k. And you compute the roots of this polynomial. And then the general theorem says that u sub n is a linear combination with some coefficients, which might be polynomials in n, of those distinct roots to the power n. So in the example that I gave you with u sub n plus 2 is equal to u sub n, the polynomial is x squared minus 1. It has roots plus minus 1. So the nth term is 1 to the n plus minus 1 to the n. Now here is where degenerate LRS comes into the picture. A sequence is called degenerate if there exists the ratio of these two roots, which is a root of unity. If there is a ratio of these two roots, which is a root of unity, like in the case of one to the n plus minus one to the n, then that sequence can collapse on an entire arithmetic progression of indices. But this is all that can happen in some sense. So you take that linear recurrent sequence, you look, you say, aha, there are some roots of unity among these ratios. You get rid of them by choosing a sufficiently large number m, such that if all these roots of unity to power m become one, and now you split your sequence along residual classes modulo m. So you get m of them, depending on whether n is 0, 1, or 2 up to m minus 1 modulo that modulus. And each one of these itself is a linear recurrent sequence now. And these ones are all non-degenerate, except that some of them might be identically 0. Like in the example that I gave you with un is odd if uh, n is equal to, it's n is odd, un is 0 if n is odd, and un is 2 if n is even. So, uh, this, so the, the theorem is that after you get rid of the degeneracies, the scholem mahler lech theorem says that the set of zeros of a non-degenerate linear recurrent sequence is fine. And the decidability is somehow equivalent to being able to compute the finite set of zeros of any given non-degenerate linear recurrent sequence. And unfortunately, all known proofs of the scholem mahler lech theorem make use of non-constructive techniques. So there is cl the classical proofs which use periodic analysis, which somehow you pick a prime P, which is a convenient prime. You again section your sequence along some number M, such that let's say all these roots are, M is a common order of all these roots, uh, modulo P. So alpha to the power M is congruent to one modulo P, which means that alpha to the M power X is congruent to one modulo P. And this one you can express this as a periodic function by writing alpha to the M X as being the exponential of the logarithm of itself. And you're applying the logarithm to some number which periodically is equal to one. So you can write this number as one plus itself minus one, which periodically is equal to zero. You expand it and then you do what you do in calculus. But, and then you get some analytic function, and then you say, oh, okay, this analytic function, the periodics are compact, therefore it has only finitely many zeros. But you cannot extract the information about how big those zeros are. And there are more modern techniques using the subspace theorem and so on, which gives you information about how many of such zeros can there be, work of Schmidt and Schlickweil and so on. But again, these are non-effective, it tells you upper bounds, which we believe they are very far from the truth because they are double, triple exponentials in some parameters of the sequence, which says the sequence cannot have more than this many zeros. Now, the Skolem problem and the positivity problem arise in several areas. For example, in theoretical biology, population dynamics, software verification, dynamical systems, weighted automata and games, control theory, formal power series and combinatorics and so on. Now for our examples, does our example finish? Let's go back to the example that we started with. It turns out that X is never equal to zero modulo three. And to see why that is like this, look at it modulo three. 
So it starts with one zero zero modulo three, these two numbers are zero, so they disappear. So X at the beginning goes from one to two, and then the other two numbers stay zero. So after the first step, you start with one zero zero, you get two zero zero. You do it again, you get four zero zero, but four is equal to one modulo three. So you get back to where you were. So in some sense, this is a sequence which is periodic of period three, if period two, and we can see that the only values are one and two, so it will never stop. It will never be zero. Now consider the Fibonacci variant. Of course, you should forget about the fact that the Fibonacci numbers are positive. We will try to use sort of periodic information about it to decide what's what. So if you start with the Fibonacci variant that starts with two and one, which is the so-called Luca sequence, then this one, you can detect it. For example, modulo five, it has no zero because it's a, of length four and it's a period of length four, which is two, one, three, four. So it takes all the non-zero classes modulo five, but it doesn't take the zero class. How about the shifted Fibonacci sequence? I started with zero and one, so I already gave it away that there is a zero there, but then I may say, let me delete that zero and be a bit tricky. And I start with one and one. But now if I take it ma2, I reduce it ma2, I notice that every third number is even. So if n is zero, ma3, then, uh, then f of n is even. If I took it ma3, then every fourth multiple, every multiple of four, it becomes zero ma3. Modulo four, every multiple of six. If sub n, if n is a multiple of six, is zero ma4. Mod five, the period is 20. You see, it starts this one, one here, and it continues only over there. But inside the period of length 20, you have four zeros. So inside this period, in fact, you have every residue class appears exactly four times. So this means that for the Fibonacci sequence, a modular argument can never work. In some sense, if you have some zero, then that zero modularly will be there. It doesn't matter if you decide to delete some terms of your sequence and start it very far away. Once you reduce it modulo something, it is always periodic. And the theorem says that it's purely periodic, especially if the modulus is co-prime to the last coefficient of the recurrence. If the period is not co-prime modulo the last coefficient of the recurrence, it might not be purely periodic. Think about x sub n plus one equal to x sub n, and you start with one. So what you get, you get powers of two. If I reduce this modulo 32, of course, it's going to be periodic. It's going to be equal to zero after a certain number of steps. But at the beginning, it isn't. So it has some pre-period. But if the modulo same is co-prime to the last coefficient, this phenomenon doesn't happen. And it's periodic from the very beginning. So the Fibonacci sequence, if you shift it, doesn't contain a zero. But modularly, you can see that it's somehow haunted by the ghost of a zero in its past. Okay, one of the things we like to do is you like to go back with them. So what does it mean to go back? Well, think of this recurrence. If I want to extend it to the left of zero, what do I do? Well, I know how much is u sub zero and I know how much is u sub one. They are zero and one. What do I have to put to the left of zero such that the sum of that number with zero is one? Well, I have to put the number one. And what do I have to put to the left of that one? Such that the sum of that number with the number one is zero is the number minus one and you get this. A minute of reflection will convince you that the numbers is the same numbers that you get as the Fibonacci numbers, except that there's a change of sign when n is even. So f sub n is minus one to the n minus one. f sub minus n is equal to minus one to the exponent n minus one times f sub n. Here is the classical arithmetic progression. And this one, you can always extend it in the past. Now this sequence, you can go with it in the past, but when you go with it in the past, then you're going to get rational numbers. You're no longer going to get integers. So let's call these two to be z-reversible and this one to not, to not be z-reversible, meaning you can always go back into the past, except that you're not going to end up with integers. You're going to end up with rational numbers. But these rational numbers are not that complicated. If you think about it, if you have some coefficient a sub k at the very end here, every time when you want to extract the next term, you're basically dividing into that coefficient. So those rational numbers are not that complicated. They are just divisible by the primes that divide the last coefficients of your recurrence. So let's formulate the bi-scolem problem. Now I take the bilinear recurrence sequence, it's over q, 
does there exist an integer n such that u sub n is equal to zero? Now, uh, let's go and call the, the linearly recurrent sequence. We will call it simple if its characteristic roots are simple. That is that minimal polynomial that you have has only simple roots. In here, the minimal polynomials are x squared minus x minus one. It has simple roots. This is x minus one squared because it's an arithmetic progression. It's a linear combination of one and n. So this one is not simple and that one is simple. For example, the Fibonacci sequence is simple. The vast majority of them are simple, but of course not all of them are. If you think of it in terms of matrices, then the simple ones correspond to diagonalizable matrices. Now, uh, um, what can we say about those zeros? Can we actually compute them? Or let's say, can we decide if it has a zero? There's various ways in which you can make that decision. The simplest decision would be to have some formula saying that, oh, the largest zero of this linear recurrent sequence is smaller than some function which depends on the length of the sequence, the magnitude of the coefficients and the magnitude of the initial terms. And it turns out there's a result from 84 and also independent from 85 by Mignot, Shori, Tideman and Vereshagen where they prove that linearly recurrent sequences of order at most four, the Skolem problem is decidable. And what sits inside there, it's basically a count on the number of roots of maximal absolute value. So if you have a root, which is a maximum absolute value, and it's by itself, then the contribution of that root to power n, it's going to beat everything from some point on, which you can write down what it is. So that is easy if you have one root, which is of absolute, maximum absolute value. If you have two roots, which are of maximum absolute value, this means that they are a root and it's complex conjugate, and the ratio of them is not a root of unity because they are non-degenerate. So now you have two competing forces, the root alpha to the power n and the root alpha bar to the power n, maybe with some coefficients, which might even be polynomial in n. Well, it turns out that this can be a little bit smaller than the absolute value of alpha to the n, but thanks to the Baker method, this can't be much smaller. You're only losing, let's say, a, a polynomial factor in n. So this contribution from these two maximum roots, it's at least the absolute value of this term may be divided by some power of n, but you're keeping the exponential char growth character of it. And because of that, you can also solve it. Now you can even do it for three roots, but that is characteristic to the fact that the sequence has integer terms, because if you have exactly three roots of maximum absolute value, then there are a number, it's conjugate, and the absolute value of these two equal numbers. So if you write some linear expression in those ones to the power n, and you factor out the absolute value of that number to the power n, then you're basically left with some trinomial in the number, let's call it t, which in the trinomial, it's the number t is going to be e to the i and theta, where theta is, let's say, the argument of alpha. So you have some coefficient times e to the i and theta, plus some other coefficient times the conjugate of that, which is its reciprocal, plus the third coefficient. And that's a quadratic polynomial in t, which you can factor. And when you factor it, it becomes a product of two binary things, t minus something, where t is e to the i and theta. And there you get to Baker's method again. So because of that, they win. And uh, actually they win even if you have the same argument shows that if you have at most three roots, which somehow are dominant in some periodic value, valuation, then you win. You either use, if they are dominant as complex, then you use some infinite valuation. And if not, you use some some finite valuation. And this is the critical ingredient, as I explained, is Baker's theory. So for linearly recurrent sequence of order at most four, the bias column is decidable. And we have some contribution last year with his colleagues, with Richard Lipton, Joris Neufeld, who is a PhD student of Joel, with Joel David Purser, who was a postdoc at that time in Saarbrücken, and James Worrell. We prove that if the sequence is reversible of order at most seven, the Skolem problem is decidable, but that's a little Galois theory problem because basically we, we used this, what we know that it can have, let's say, if you have at most three dominant roots, then you're fine. But having the notion of reversibility, this means that these roots are actually units because the polynomial that you're looking at has the last coefficients plus minus one. And then you can ask how ugly can that polynomial be so that all its roots are units and at least three of them are, at least four of them have the same absolute value. And you prove that polynomials of degree at most seven cannot have that property. 
but there is examples of polynomials of degree eight that have that property. So that's why our argument breaks down there. And there is an older result of about 10 years ago about positivity, which is decidable for general recurrent sequences up to five of Joel and Ben. And then if you further impose simplicity, then it's decidable up to nine. Okay, so now since we can't do better, it's time to throw in some conjectures into the pot. So many problems in mathematics and computer science are solvable subject to various standard conjectures. For example, Riemann's hypothesis or the belief that factoring is not in polynomial time that depends the security of the RSA, the decidability of the first order theory of real arithmetic with exponentiation is subject to Shanwell's conjecture. So since I mentioned Shanwell conjecture, let's recall what the Shanwell conjecture is. So Shanwell conjecture the following, take n complex numbers which are linearly independent over Q and look at the field obtained by adjoining these two n numbers to Q, which are the num n numbers you start with and their exponentials. So the theorem, the conjecture is that the degree of transcendence of this field is at least n. Equivalently, if you have n complex numbers which are linearly independent over Q, then within this set of two n numbers, one can find at least n of them, which are algebraically independent over Q. And you can see why the condition of linearly independent over Q is, because if, for example, one number is the sum of the other two, then the exponential of that number is the product of the exponential of the other two. So you need some linearly independent condition. And uh, here are some examples. We know that E is transcendental. We know that pi is transcendental. What about E plus pi and E pi? Of course, they can't be both algebraic because if they are both algebraic, then E plus pi and E pi are algebraic. So this polynomial, which has E and pi as roots, is a polynomial with algebraic coefficients. So this makes one of them transcendental. But which one? Probably both of them are transcendental. But uh, we don't know that. What about uh, other more complicated examples like this one? So let's apply the Shannon conjecture with the two numbers one and i pi. So the Shannon conjecture says that within this set, one i pi e to the one e to the i pi, there should be two numbers which are algebraically independent. But e to the i pi is negative one. So the only two numbers that can be algebraically independent are those two, i pi and e, and e is algebraic, and i is algebraic, so pi and e should be algebraically independent. Thus, for any non-zero polynomial with rational algebraic coefficients, we should have that p of the pair e pi cannot be zero. In particular, those examples must all be irrational, assuming this conjecture. So in particular, Shannon's conjecture implies that there are no algebraic relationships. Hey, you can write something like that, but that's not an algebraic relation. Okay, what does this have to do with the, our linear recurrent sequence? Well, let's start with the linear recurrent sequence. Let's reverse it. Now we are assuming in general, we will assume shortly that it's simple, but for the, now we no longer assume that a sub k is plus minus one so that it is reversible, but it can be any number at once. But now I take a modulus m, which is co-prime to a sub k. Since it's co-prime to a sub k, m thinks that this is a sequence modulo m. It behaves like the integers. For example, this sequence, if I reduce it mod 3, it becomes that sequence. And if I reduce it mod 5, it becomes that sequence. So the prime 3 doesn't care that I'm dividing by things. Because for the prime 3, a sub k, I can divide by it. Because it's inverse, it's also well-defined modulo m. There is a fairly wide ranging conjectures formulated in 1937, which is known as the exponential local global principle. And like Shannon's conjecture is widely believed by number theories, but only proven in special cases. So what this column conjecture is, consider this recurrence relation and suppose that this sequence is simple. There is some reason for that. And I'll give you a counter example as to why this conjecture is false for non-simple sequences. Then the conjecture says that this sequence has no zeros. If and only if for some integer m, which is co-prime to k, we have that u sub n is not zero mod m. So in some sense, what this conjecture says, the conjecture says that if the sequence has no zero, 
then there must be a modulus that notices that, that witnesses the fact that there is no zero. So uh, why is it false for non-simple sequences? Well, I can give you the, 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 one of the easiest examples. It's a sequence of the form two to the power n times two n plus one. This sequence doesn't have any zero. Even if you go to negative numbers, it's still not going to have any zero. Well, it has a rational zero, but let's not count that one, then, which is at minus one half. So I have two to the n plus one, two to the power n multiplied with two n plus one. Does this have a zero modulo every m, which is uh, modulo every m? And I say, of course it does, because when you look at two to the n times two n plus one, you can put the power of two, you're already winning it for free for large n. So you can look only at the odd part of m, but then you, you solve two n plus one is equal to zero modulo the odd part of m and you get a solution. So you get infinite many solutions. So that will have zeros modulo any m. So we proved that the scoring problem for linear recurrent sequences of order five is decidable, assuming just the scoring conjecture. So that is one small step. As we said before, we could do it up to four. Now we can do it with five. But uh, which, whether they are simple or not. But here is the important theorem in the, of this section. There is an algorithm which takes as inputs a simple non-degenerate linear recurring sequence and produces its finite set of zeros. And the termination is guaranteed assuming the Skolem conjecture and the piadic shanriel conjecture. And the way this argument works is the following. So there's two problems there. Problem number one, decide if the sequence has a, se has a zero. And problem number two, find all the zeros of that sequence. Well, if you only assume the Skolem conjecture, then you can already solve problem number one. And here is how you do. You start two algorithms, two programs. One of them is looking for zeros, and one of them is looking for witnesses that there are no zeros. So one of them goes through all the modulus m co prime to ak and calculates the values of u sub n modulo m, which you can do in finitely many steps because the sequence is periodic. And if the Skolem conjecture is true, then one of the two algorithms will stop. Either there is a zero and the first algorithm will find it. Either there is no zero and the second algorithm will find a witness that there is no zero. So, so far, we can construct just out of the Skolem conjecture, we can find whether there is a zero or not using these two things. Now, what about finding all the zeros? So, as I said, well, well, the important thing to mention here is that we actually implemented this algorithm, and this algorithm is only needed to prove termination, not correctedness. So the algorithm, if it works, is going to produce a correctedness certificate, which is independent of all the conjectures. The only thing that is needed for, the only way that the only part uh, of the proof that needs those conjectures is to show that this algorithm actually terminates. And it's implemented in this uh, online tool, which is called Skolem. So if you want to get Skolem, you can, you can go here or it's accessible from the webpage of my colleague, Joel Wagnin. You go to his webpage, there is some software that he has, he and his team have developed, and this is one of them. So what does the Skolem problem do? You're gonna be faced with this. You're going to have to promise that the sequence that you're given is simple, that you're not trying to trick it by giving it polynomials with multiple roots and so on. You give those values and those, the, the initial values and the coefficients, and it will produce some list. And it will say, for example, here are the zeros. For example, for this particular example, there are zero, one, and four. And then there's a list. And the list says, these are the only zeros as it can be proved by this sequence of congruences. So all the other ends, which are not one of those, they are going to be trapped in some congruence. There is some congruence class modulo, some modulus such which is congruent to that number n, which is not a zero for which n is not zero modulo that modulus. And here is the key technical tool. The key technical tool is the following, start with the non-degenerate linear recurrent sequence. Do the algorithm that I said that you do, you have these two algorithms, one of them which looks for zero, one of them which looks for witnesses. If you find a witness that it's not zero, then you're done and it's over, there's no zero. So let's suppose the first algorithm finds a zero. Then what do you do next? Well, what you do next, you can shift that zero into the origin. And then somehow you have to go further 
So how can we go further? Here is the important lemma. Assuming the periodic channel conjecture, one can compute an integer m such that if you look at this sequence only over the multiples of that integer m, then that sequence has no other zeros. This is the key technical lemma, meaning it has a zero when little n is equal to zero, but for little n greater or equal to one, it has no zero. So once you are done, you have that, then you're basically done. Because why is it then you're done? Well, you compute this number capital M. This is what actually the program does. It computes this number capital M. Now, once you says find this number, it splits N into residue classes modulo capital M and says, let's go through the residue class, let's say R modulo capital M. Well, if R is equal to zero, this is exactly the sequence. And the lemma says there is no further zeros there. Don't bother going that way. You should just look at the other M minus one sequences. So now you reinitiate your problem with every one of these m minus one sequences, and you start either looking for zero or witnesses and so on. And the fact that there's only finitely many zeros will guarantee that this procedure terminates. So where do we assume the periodic channel conjecture? We have to assume something about, so as I said, you take, as I mentioned in the older proofs of the Skole Mahler Lech, you take some suitable prime P you associate some analytic function and you have to look at the zeros of this analytic function. And so you have to look at, let's say some, uh, the periodic zero, you have a, since you're in zero, you have a periodic zero there. And then you have to look at the expansion around this zero. But when you look at the exponential of the logarithm of something times X and you expand that in series, then of course the first term is zero, but what's the next term? The next term is basically the first derivative. And the first derivative of the exponential of the log is the log. So the first uh, uh, derivative is a linear combination in those logs. And the second derivative is a quadratic polynomial, which is homogeneous in those logs. And the third derivative is a cubic polynomial, which is homogeneous in those logs and so on. So maybe if you're in the first case, you can get away by periodic Baker's method and so on. Oh, maybe if, if it's not zero, then I can even bound it. And, but as you go to quadratic relations among the logs, cubic relations among the logs, then you are stuck. There is no unconditional results. And that's where we are assuming the periodic general conjecture, meaning that if there is no obvious relation between those logs, then that coefficient is non-zero. And then you can apply Strassmann's theorem or something like that. So the resulting sequence is guaranteed not to contain any zeros and an independent correctiveness certificate can be produced. And this periodic channel conjecture is only needed to ensure termination, namely being able to calculate this number capital M. And here is some little example of something that has zeros and then you keep on doing this periodic leapfrogging. So you draw circles and circles larger and larger. And then you get something very complicated at the end. All right. Okay, so let me go over this one. Okay, so now I have another maybe, uh, what is it, 20 minutes, 15 minutes? Let me talk about a different uh, topic so, so far. So my uh, presentation is called Progress on the Skolem Problem. So we made some progress on the Skolem Problem, assuming two conjectures. And we uh, basically solved it for simple linearly recurring sequences, assuming these two conjectures. Now uh, we said, let's initiate a different program. So the program that gave us unconditional results, which was based on the Baker method and so on, was based on the enumeration of those roots of dominant absolute value. So if you don't have too many of those roots, then somehow you can have a lot of cancellation. Of course, thanks to the subspace theorem, you know that you don't have enough, you don't have too much calculation for large n. So this, in the, independently of how many dominant roots you have, you still don't have a lot of cancellation for large n, but you don't know what large n means. So this, uh, so then what we, we initiated, we initiated a different thing. Instead of saying that the sequence is bad and the integer is good, we said that the, all the sequences are good and the integer, some of them are bad and some of them are good. So the good integers are the integers for which you can test any linearly recurrent sequence, whether it has a zero in that integer. And the bad integers are the integers for which we don't yet know how to do that. So let's say that S is a universal Skolem set. If there is an effective procedure, such that given a linear recurrent sequence U, 
outputs whether or not there is an integer n in this set such that u sub n is equal to zero. And we stole this definition from the notion of a universal Hilbert set. What is the universal Hilbert set? So Hilbert's theorem says the following. Let's start with the polynomial, which is a polynomial with rational coefficients, which is irreducible as a polynomial in two variables, which is not linear or constant in X. So X has degree at least two. And then you can ask, okay, fine. Let's start evaluating this polynomial in some integers, make Y equal to some integer. Then I get some polynomial of one variable. And this polynomial of one variable at degree at least two sometimes is irreducible, sometimes is not. And what can you say about the irreducibility of it? So Hilbert's irreducibility theorem asserts that the set of integers for which P of capital X and N is reducible is of density zero. So most integers that you're gonna stick into here, the polynomial F and one variable of X is going to keep the property of being irreducible. So most in the sense of measure or density. So the number of those Ms of absolute value at most T, if I divide that number by T and I make T go to infinity, then this number, this limit is zero. And S.D. Cohen proved that in fact, this set is uh, at least big O of T to the one half multiplied by log T. So it's really thin. This, uh, this little O of T implied by this limit, it's not like the primes, but it's more like the square roots. But there are polynomials for which you do get the square roots. For example, X squared minus Y. If we evaluate Y to be a perfect square, then this polynomial, of course, factors. And up to T, they are about square root of T perfect squares. And if Y is, is an integer which is not a perfect square, then it does affect. So motivated by such a result, the universal Hilbert set is an infinite set of integers with the property that it intersects this bad set transversely in only finitely many points for every irreducible polynomials P of X, Y with values with rational coefficients. And Bilu proved, gave an explicit example. He showed that the set of integers of the form m cubed plus this little thing, the integer part of double log of the absolute value of m, this is a universal Hilbert set. So whenever you take any polynomial of degree at least two in x, which is irreducible, and you make y to be equal to a member of this guy, then you get the Diophantine equation. And this Diophantine equation has only finitely many solutions as the Diophantine equation in the variable x and the integer m. And Filaceta and Wilcox constructed a dense universal Hilbert set. So the first one that we constructed was in 2021. And here is this strange construction. Take the following function, which is defined on the set of natural numbers except for zero, which takes n and it sends it to something a little bit smaller than log n, which should be an integer. So the little bit smaller, we chose it to be square root of log n, but you can choose log n to two thirds or to one minus epsilon. And define the following sequence. So the zeroth term is one, and the nth term is the factorial of n plus the value in the of the sequence in the index f of n, where f of n is given by this. So this definition is somehow recursively calling itself. But since f of n is strictly smaller than n, by the time you get to this step, everything else be before that has already been defined. So, so you can I even list this, but look how slowly this grows. So basically what s of n is, is uh, some huge factorial plus some tiny factorial about like the factorial of the square root of log of n integer part plus something which is the factorial of the square root of log of the previous one. So it's basically like a double log and so on. So the nth term is basically a sum of a few factorials, but each one of them goes down very quickly to zero. And I claim that this one is a universal Skolem set. Well, you see, when I say that something is a universal Skolem set, it's not enough for me to show you the set. I also have to, to explain to you what am I doing? How can I make sure, how can I compute the the, the set of zeros of any linearly recurrent sequence in this sequence, because otherwise, why would you believe me that this is a universal Skolem set? So here is the important lemma. Suppose that un is given by this minimal recurrence. I take delta to be the discriminant of this characteristic polynomial. Actually, this delta might be zero. It's better to take delta to be the maybe the discriminant of the uh, decomposition field of this polynomial or something like that. 
Then the proposition is the following. Take this linearly recurrent sequence, take a prime, which is small enough, but it can be any prime other than finitely many bad primes. So the bad primes are the primes which divide this coefficient, meaning somewhere in some extension, there might be some prime ideal that divides the roots and that divide the discriminant of the field or of the polynomial and so on. And suppose that the prime is not so large, it's up to m to the one over d. Then u sub n plus m factorial looks like u sub n modulo p. And the proof of this is very easy. It's basically Fermat's theorem in algebraic number fields. So what you do, you look at, let's say alpha is a characteristic root of that sequence. And that sequence, it's a linear combination of alpha to this inputs n. So I look at alpha to the power n plus m factorial. Now p is very small. Alpha, let's say it's invertible modulo p. This means that it's going to have some order. And the order of it divides something of the form p to the f minus one, where f is, let's say, the inertia of some prime ideal sitting over p. But the point is that p to the f minus one is at most p to the d minus one, which is a part of m factorial. So this alpha to the m factorial disappears modulo p, and it becomes so alpha to the n plus m factorial becomes just alpha to the n. So in particular, this congruence is true. So this is, you just write down the characteristic equation and you prove it. So in particular, here is why this is a universal scholem set. Suppose that u has f of, of s of n equal to zero and write down the formula of s of n. It's n factorial plus s, which is much smaller. And then apply this previous lemma in here. This previous lemma in here, it tells you basically that you can get rid of this factorial and that USS of f of n is going to be zero modulo p for a bunch of primes. What does it mean a bunch of primes? All but finitely many of them and all of them up to n to the one over d. And you multiply these primes together up to n to the one over d and then by the prime number theorem, you get the exponential of log of n, the exponential of n to the one over d and the exponential of n to the one over d, it's the double exponential of log of n divided by d. But how big is this guy? This guy is basically, let's say the dominant root in S of f of n and S of f of n is like the factorial of f of n. And the factorial of f of n, so it's the exponential, you have one exponential because of the root, you get another exponential because of the factorial, but it's basically the double exponential of f of n. And now this is why we chose f of n to be here, because this function is much smaller than the exponential of double logarithm of n to the power d. And now you use this argument that says that if an integer divides another integer, which is of a smaller size, then the other integer has to be the integer zero. So this means that this being zero forces this being zero. And now it's perfect. Now you have a little machine. If this is zero, then the next one is zero, and the next one is zero, and you keep on going down. But you see, now you get too many zeros of this linearly recurring sequence. We have very concrete bounds on how many of them they can be. For example, there's a res result of Schlickweil that of Schmidt that says that the number of, of zeros of a linearly recurring sequence of order k is at most triple exponential in k. It's at most x of x of k of something like x of x of x of 3k log k. And it doesn't even assume that this sequence has integer coefficients. It could be any complex numbers for initial values and recurrence and so on. So, uh, Actually, this was a cute six-page paper. It even got some distinguished paper word at the conference in logic and computer science. But how thick is our set? Well, the set is not very thick since uh, S of n is up to x and it's a bit like factorial and it's very, very low. So can we do better? And then we say that, yes, we can do better. And this is uh, one of my last slides. This is a very complicated slide, but I will try to explain the content of it. So let's say log sub k of x is going to be the iterated logarithm of x. So this is threefold iterated logarithm of x. Now for x sufficiently large, choose two sets of numbers, a of x and b of x. a of x is up to about square root of log x. And just to make things easy, consider primes in here. And you chop off the beginning of a few of them because of some technical reason. And B of X, basically, you, can, you consider a dyadic interval, which starts around something that's little O of log of X. 
let's like, let's say log of x over the square root of triple log x. Now with these two statistics, take a number between x and 2x and try to represent it in the following way. Write n and look for representations of the form q capital P plus a, where q is a prime in here, a is an integer in there, and the result capital P is whatever comes out of this equation. Now you might say, how do you even do that? Well, it, it's easy. Let me explain to you how you do that. You fix the number n, and you fix a prime q in here. So you fixed n and q. What's left are a and p. Now for this equation to make sense in integers, a has to be known modulo q, because q is already fixed and n is fixed. So a has to be known modulo q. So you go into this interval and you say, OK, let me pick up numbers in here. I can pick up any number I want. It just has to be correct, modulo a. But see, a goes up the square root of log x. And this interval has size around log x. You lose a little bit. So this interval has size roughly log x divided by a times this fudge. So you certainly have many candidates. All of those, all those candidates, when you compute the expression n minus a over q, you're going to get integers. And every now and then these integers are primes. And if enough of them are primes, let's say at least quadruple log of x or something like that, then you have some other technical conditions. Then you say the integer n is good and you put it in your set, the set of good integers. I claim that the set of good integers is a universal squalem set. And why is that? Well, let's go back to that expression with, uh, let's say, linear combination of powers of alpha to the n, where alpha is some number. So we try to use the same argument as we used before, divisibility with some prime p. So the divisibility with some prime p is going to be this prime. So I look at alpha to the power n, and I write n as being little q times p plus a. Well, alpha to the power p, let's assume that we are in the fortunate case, like Fermat's little theorem. Then alpha to the power p becomes one modulo p, so it goes away. So alpha to the power n becomes alpha to the q plus a. So asking of u sub n is equal to zero, basically is asking for u in the index q plus a to be equal to zero. But look at q plus a. q plus a is little o of log x, and the prime p is around x, so this is the exponential of the log of x. This makes the prime p bigger than u sub q plus a, and u sub q plus a still has to be a multiple of p, therefore is equal to zero. But if it n is equal to zero many times, because this has many representations, but we have a formula. We say that the number of zeros cannot be too big. This means that the number of zero, which is at least quadruple log x, is bounded by, let's say, the triple exponential in k. So you get that x or n is bounded by a sevenfold exponential in k. And this is true inside this set. Of course, there is more things to do because uh, maybe uh, alpha to the p is not necessarily equal to alpha, might be some conjugate of alpha. So, so there's more things going into here. And why is this of positive density? This is of positive density because you can use Cauchy-Schwarz. So you use Cauchy-Schwarz and you compute the sum of the number of representations of n in this way, and you get some obvious upper bound. And then you compute the second moment, which is the sum of r n squared. And then it's like doing twin primes. You're counting q p plus a equal q prime p prime plus a prime. And this is an upper bound sieve, which is not very hard. And you do Cauchy-Schwarz and you get a positive proportion of them. We believe that this positive proportion is the proportion one, and uh, because basically the bag of numbers that we are associating to it grows a little bit larger than the logarithm of x to every n, which means that we should get enough primes to do that. So anyway, if you go through some, for example, we contacted uh, uh, Jan Hendrik Everze and he pointed out some interesting references. And using that, we said, well, in our, set, which is of positive lower density, all the solutions of all the zeros of this linearly recurring sequence satisfy this inequality. x sub 3 is the triple fold exponential in A, x sub 5 is the quintuple exponential in A in those parameters, where this is, if you want, the complexity of the sequence, how big it is at the start, how long it is, and how large the coefficients and initial values are. And uh, 
And this is what I wanted to show you. So I wanted to show you something about the Skolem problem. The positivity problem is even less is known. And that's it, I will stop here.